In this screencast, we are going to discuss the physics of ultrasound image optimization. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to explain how transducer frequency impacts image quality, specifically resolution and penetration. You should be able to identify and describe the meaning of the different information on the ultrasound image itself, so the notations on the image and how they are impacting the image that you're seeing, and describe how you can control the different variables to impact the quality of the image that is being generated. When we think about image optimization, we can break down the different user controlled variables into a few basic categories, which we see here. And we will go through each of these one at a time and explain how they impact the image that we are creating. So let's look at this image. When we look at this image and we wanna know what type of transducer was used to generate this image, we can look at the notation provided here, typically in that left upper corner, and we see C5 to 1. This notation may be different on different machines from different vendors, but in this case, the C refers to a curved linear probe, and the 5 to 1 means that it has a range of 5 megahertz to 1 megahertz. So that provides us with the type of transducer that was used to generate this image. We can also use other clues like this curved footprint to let us know that we're using a curved probe. Remember, curved linear probes have a geometry that permits a wide field of view. They tend to be lower in frequency so that they penetrate more deeply at the cost of resolution. We use them frequently for body imaging. <clears throat> when we look at this image and we try to think about what type of probe we have, again, we can look up at the notation in the left hand corner of our image and we see L12 to 5. That indicates we are using a linear probe with a frequency range of 12 megahertz to 5 megahertz. We can also gather that we're using a linear probe by this wide footprint that is flat and the high resolution imaging of a superficial structure. In this case, the submental area of the neck. When we think about how transmit frequency impacts image quality and our attempt to optimize our imaging, remember, Increasing the frequency increases our axial resolution, so our superficial to deep resolution. When you increase the frequency, you decrease your penetration. Therefore, high frequency probes cannot be used to image deep structures. This trade off of axial resolution and penetration is essential for understanding which probe to use in which setting and what you may sacrifice if you're trying to image a very deep structure. Here's an example of adjustment of your power. So in the first image here, we have a low power output. We're looking at the liver and the kidney. And you can see that we have poor penetration and decreased echogenicity compared to the image here with increased power. One of the ways that we know we're increasing our power is that we have the same field of view, we're using the same probe at the same frequency, our dynamic range is the same, we have harmonics on, but we can see that our thermal index and our mechanical index have gone up substantially in the image on the right compared to the image on the left. So let's dig a little more deeply into thermal index. 
Again, when you're looking at an image and you want to know the thermal index, traditionally it is in the right upper quadrant and it is defined as TI, although this may vary between vendors and machines, the thermal index. The thermal index is the ratio of the transmit power that is needed to increase the temperature of the tissue by one degree Celsius. So if your thermal index says 0 0.01, that means the power of your ultrasound beam has the potential to increase the temperature within the tissue by 0.1 degrees Celsius. Whereas a thermal index of two, which would be a very high thermal index, could increase the temperature of the tissue by up to two degrees. Now let's talk about mechanical index. Like thermal index, the mechanical index is often noted in the right upper portion of your image and abbreviated by MI, although there can be variability between vendors and machines. The mechanical index is a measurement or a reference for the potential for cavitation. So the mechanical energy that is being transmitted in an ultrasound wave, as it compresses and causes rarefaction of the tissue, there is a potential for injury to that tissue. And that the injury that would occur would be due to cavitation from that mechanical energy passing through the tissue. Most of the time we are using a low enough mechanical index that we are not going to cause cavitation of the tissue. There are therapeutic uses of ultrasound where targeted ultrasound can be used to ablate lesions or classically break up renal stones. In medical diagnostic imaging, understanding the mechanical index is critical for performing contrast enhanced ultrasound. And that is because a high mechanical index can rupture the micro bubbles that we are injecting into the bloodstream. When you are doing contrast enhanced imaging, you have to minimize that mechanical index so that the micro bubbles have time to circulate through and give you the characteristic enhancement patterns of the lesions you are trying to detect. An advantage of contrast enhanced ultrasound is that we can turn up our mechanical index, cause the micro bubbles to all rupture through cavitation, and then we can re-inject the patient with a new dose of micro bubbles and re-image an organ, a structure, or look at a different lesion than was in our field of view on our first pass. It's important to remember that all forms of Doppler imaging have a higher mechanical index than the forms of grayscale imaging. They also have a higher thermal index. Because of the high mechanical index and thermal index of Doppler ultrasound, we avoid using Doppler in the first trimester of pregnancy due to potential risks for cavitation within the very small developing and delicate fetus. Instead of using pulse spectral wave or color or power Doppler in the first trimester, we actually use an M-mode Doppler. And that M-mode Doppler has a very low mechanical and thermal index and is therefore felt to be safer for imaging in the first trimester. And we will discuss that in future screencasts. Now let's discuss gain as it compares to power. Gain is really an amplification of the echoes that we receive back to the probe. So unlike power, which is impacting the echoes that we are sending out from the probe, when we receive the reflections back, they stimulate the piezoelectric crystals generate little electronic impulses. We amplify those electronic impulses to increase or decrease the brightness of our image. We don't have to do this for the entire image. 
we can do it for just a portion of the image. This is called time gain compensation. And typically, you increase the gain of deep structures or echoes that took longer to return to the probe compared to the gain that you have for superficial structures or echoes that were short in returning back to the probe. So that time gain compensation can allow you to improve the homogeneity of your image. Remember, gain is a post-processing technique. It does not impact the transmitted pulse, where power is like a pre-processing technique where you are increasing the amplitude of the ultrasound waves that you send out. So let's look at some examples of increasing gain. We have images from left to right that show increasing gain. So the same image with the same probe with all of the same features, except for here we have our gain low and here we have our gain very high. When you're looking for time gain compensation, you will often see a small gradient. It's depicted differently on different vendors, but here we can see that they've compensated okay, slightly differently for deep structures compared to superficial structures. So that's your time gain compensation. And then overall, there's substantially increased gain on this image compared to this image. But this is more optimized for appropriate image quality. Now let's talk about focal zone. The focal zone is less important in modern ultrasound imaging because a lot of our ultrasound machines will autofocus or have multiple focal zones. But the focal zone is depicted on your image typically by this type of shape, and it can be adjusted by the user to focus on more superficial or deep structures. Traditionally, you want your focal zone to be at the level of the organ of interest. In this case, we're looking at our liver kidney interface and our renal cortex, and so we have our focal zone deeper. If we were looking at the liver for masses or at the liver surface for nodularity, we might move our focal zone up higher to optimize the quality of the image in that location. Again, going back to a diagram from ultrasound requisites, you are essentially picking the point where the beam density or the pulse density is the greatest. And that improves your lateral resolution, making your overall resolution more optimal within the focal zone. Again, modern machines can do multi-level focusing. They achieve that by averaging multiple frames together that have focal zones in different locations. This will decrease your frame rate and if you're doing real-time grayscale imaging, can cause some lagging. Like compound imaging, it may also reduce shadowing artifacts. And modern machines will often accomplish autofocusing without substantial user input. When we think about our field of view or changing the size of our image, one of the impacts that a changing field of view has is on our frame rate. So how many frames per second are we generating on our real-time grayscale imaging? If you increase your field of view, you will cause a decrease in your frame rate. And that is because to generate each image, you are going to have to listen for a longer period of time to get all of the echoes to return to the probe to be able to generate that image. So if you increase your depth or increase your field of view, you wait longer for those returning echoes and your frame rate goes down. If you decrease the field of view, you don't have to wait as long to receive all your echoes back to the probe and your frame rate will increase. Line density is 
often something that we do not have a lot of user control over, but it is determined by how independent each crystal is functioning. And if you need to remember basic things about line density, it's that if you increase your line density, you will increase that lateral resolution, but you decrease your frame rate. So you're improving your resolution at the penalty of frame rate. If you need to increase your frame rate, then you may sacrifice some lateral resolution. So decreasing the line density will decrease your resolution and improve your frame rate. The dynamic range of an image is a user controllable variable that impacts your contrast. When you have a high dynamic range image, there is minimal compression of amplitudes into similar grayscale units. And so there is a smoother image with less contrast. A low dynamic range image compresses similar amplitudes into the same grayscale unit. And that causes a greater difference between larger structures and a more contrasty image. So if you want, need a smoother image, you want a high dynamic range. If you want a higher contrast to your image, you will want a lower dynamic range. Again, dynamic range, and we can see the dynamic range in notation here in the upper left, dynamic range at 70% versus dynamic range at 41%. Persistence is a imaging factor similar to compound imaging. In this case, you are taking multiple single images and averaging them together to create an image with higher signal and lower noise. It does take more time to acquire multiple images to create the one 2D image that you see, and so this impacts real-time grayscale imaging by decreasing the frame rate or increasing the blurring. It is very similar, again, to compound imaging, where you're averaging multiple images captured at different angles. In this case, there's no angle variation. To optimize your ultrasound images, you need to understand the different variables that are within your control or the sonographer's control. Realize that there are always trade-offs. When you are optimizing one component of the image, you are likely negatively impacting a different feature of the image. Really recognizing these trade-offs and knowing how they're gonna impact image quality is gonna put you in the driver's seat to create the best ultrasound images that you can. It will also allow you to do quality assurance checks on the images that you're being given. Say you are reading remotely, ultrasound images are being generated in another hospital. You can quickly look at all of the information and notation supplied on an image, look at the quality of the image, and you can start to understand why is this image suboptimal? Does the ultrasonographer know what they're doing? Or is it a patient who has difficult body habitus or is having difficulty holding their breath or holding still? In summary, when I'm gonna take an ultrasound image, the first thing I wanna know is, am I getting a superficial structure or a deep structure? That's gonna make me choose a linear probe for high resolution superficial structures or a curved probe or a phased probe for deeper structures. If I have a nice sonographic window, I hope to use the curved linear probe, which will give me higher resolution images than a phased or sector probe. Once I've selected my probe, I'm going to start looking at the image. I'm going to adjust my depth or my field of view so that it's optimal for the structures I'm trying to look at. That will give me better axial resolution. It will also improve my frame rate. I then will adjust the overall gain of the image to make sure that it is uh, has a nice contrast to it. And then I may do time gain compensation where I am adjusting 
the deeper structures or increasing the gain of the deeper structures relative to the superficial structures. Finally, I want my harmonics on, I want compounding on, and I want a nice high dynamic range for most imaging situations. Thank you for your time. I hope you'll consider continuing through this ultrasound physics series.